I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia and Young Harris College. Our guest is Mary Beasley, longtime staff member of Georgia governors, lieutenant governors, and United States senators. Uh, Mary, we're honored to have you. Thank you, Bob. I'm honored to be here. Well, before we get into a discussion about your many years at the state capitol, let's talk about Mary Beasley. Tell us about yourself. I was born in Athens, Georgia. My father was a professor at the university in the School of Agriculture. I lived in Athens until I was about 12 or 13 years old, and then I moved to Crawfordville. I lived in Crawfordville until I moved to Atlanta in 1959. Let's talk about your first job uh, in the state capitol. I was hired by Mr. Ben Fortson as one of the receptionists and in, on the information desk on the ground floor of the state capitol. My desk sat right in front of the elevators that took everybody up and down to all floors. At the time I came to the capitol, the state government telephone directory was an eight by 10 by fold printed on four sides and that gave all the state numbers. Many of the agencies were housed in the Capitol, beginning with in room 100, we had the Commerce Department, then we had the Revenue Department, we had the uh, Auditor's Office, we had many offices of the Secretary of State, the examining boards, some of them were there, and also corporations. Then we had an office there, you could renew your driver's license. We had the state purchasing department, and all that was almost on the ground floor. Then on the second floor was the governor's office, some more offices of the Secretary of State. The Comptroller General's office was there, and the state treasurer's office was there. The third floor of the Capitol were the legislative uh, chambers and the clerk secretary of the House. I don't think the clerk of the Senate stayed open all the time. I know the secretary of the Senate's office was just open uh, a short portion of the year. From the time the legislature went into session until they proofed the uh, journal in March. Then on the fourth floor, we had the Game and Fish, and the Pardon and Paroles, and the Department of Corrections, and I'm sure I've omitted some of them, but all of those agencies were housed in the state capitol in, in the 1959 through 1960s. Then it was from the Secretary of State's office that you went to work for the governor. That's right. I had been there on that information desk where I could meet everybody that worked at the Capitol. I got to know many of the uh, legislators as they came and went, and that was a really good on-the-job training for the job that came available to me in the governor's office. When a spot became available there, I was hired to be the receptionist in the governor's office in 1959. And that was Governor Ernest Vandiver? Yes. Tell us about Governor Vanderer. Well, first I want to tell you what Mr. Ben Thornton told me. He had advised me not to go into the governor's office. He said, when your job is over and when Governor Vanderer leaves the Capitol, you will not have a job. But that didn't stop me from going into the governor's office. I went right on in. And what, was your, what were your duties in the governor's office originally? I was a receptionist and handled a lot of the scheduling. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about Governor Vandiver. What do you remember about Governor Vandiver? Well, I remember Governor Vandiver won his race for governor by carrying 156 counties out of 159. He lost Worth County. He lost Tiff County, where uh, Bill Bodenheimer was running against him and he lost Decatur County where Marvin Griffin was from. He came in as a very strong governor. Well, do you have a favorite Vandiver story? 
Well, I do know he had to operate a lot under court orders. He had one on the desegregation that he had to comply with, and in order to to implement that, he set up the John Sibley Commission that traveled all over the state of Georgia and then reported back, and they recommended that the schools be desegregated. Then Governor Vandiver had to go back before the legislature in a special night session to request that they change the law because no state appropriations could go into segregated schools. And he was fortunate enough to get that changed. Mm -hmm. And we did have um, peaceful in integration. Mm -hmm. So you were there the whole Vanderbilt term? Yes. Four years? Well, three and a half. Three and a half years. Then what happened next? Well, when he came in, uh, he was interested in cleaning up some corruption. So he had Mr. Bill Bowden in the purchasing department to start and find uh, lots of fraud and waste in purchasing. In fact, we had some, some ponds that wouldn't hold water and some boats that leaked. But he was instrumental in, in getting all that corrected and cutting state government across the board 10% and then providing more services. But his biggest accomplishment was desegregating the schools and uh, the university system. Mm -hmm. And then you went to work in the lieutenant governor's office. Yes. Uh, I went to work for Peter Zach Gear. He had been the executive secretary to Governor Vandiver. And he had also run and won the office of lieutenant governor in the late uh, 19, what date was that? 63. He won in 62, and I guess he took office in 1963. All right. He was an excellent presiding officer in the Senate. That was his major duties. And at that time in state government, they didn't have a office and a secretary for every senator. And the lieutenant governor's office seemed to serve the entire members of the Senate, which was about 52 members. Because the secretary of the Senate's office, as I said, was not open full time. And I guess the greatest thing he achieved was uh, presiding over the legislature when they elected Governor Maddox governor. That was in 1967? Yes. Then you were asked to join the staff of Governor Maddox. Yes, and I talked with, um, I think I discussed this with uh, my friend Zell Miller, and he advised me to go ahead and work for Governor Maddox because Governor, he had worked in the Maddox administration. He, he was going to work in it. And Governor Maddox had no commitments, no obligations. He had won the race almost independently of the legislature, and he had no commitments to hire people. So I was pleased that I was asked to work for him. Mm -hmm. What were your duties with uh, Governor Maddox? I did his scheduling and was a personal assistant mm -hmm. to help with anything that I needed to do. Well, he was certainly a colorful governor. Uh, he had People's Day. Yes, he did. We always uh, set that up, I think, maybe twice a month. And he brought in all the agency heads that would relate to any questions that he might be asked. And everyone that came got to speak with him, shake his hand, and pose the question. And if it was something that he could help with in another department or agency, he would call in that uh, agency head to take action with the request of the constituent, and, which and was very effective. And he traveled a lot. Yes, he never got tired. <laughs> he was perpetual motion. How and, you, you, and you do know he did run for governor, I mean president one time. Yes. Did you do that scheduling? I was in uh, Chicago with him. I mm -hmm. went as a staff person, so 
I have been fortunate to be in two presidential campaigns. All right. How will you remember Governor Maddox? It's very thoughtful and appreciative of all that was done for him, even the smallest thing. He couldn't thank you enough. And even after he left the office for many years, we gathered to celebrate his birthday on September the 30th with lots of longtime friends and supporters. Mm -hmm. uh, governor Maddox was uh, fortunate to be elected lieutenant governor after he left office. Uh, where were you at, during that period? Well, I had just worked for him for four years. And then he went to the lieutenant governor's office with an overwhelming percentage. Mm -hmm. And I had also been asked to stay on with Governor Carter. And I was undecided what to do because I had enjoyed working for Governor Maddox, but I had known uh, Governor Carter from his days in the state senate. So I discussed it with my friend, again, Zell Miller, and he advised me to stay with Governor Carter because of the space limitation. He thought I would do better in bigger space than in a smaller, confined office. So mm -hmm. I made my decision to stay on with, with Governor Carter. And what did you do with Governor Carter? I did his scheduling. And he traveled a lot? And he traveled a lot, yes. Were you surprised when he ran for president? No, you could begin to see signs of that the last year he was governor, he um, read everything that came into the office that was sent in by the federal government, looking at all regional meetings and, uh, and applying himself to study and know a lot about the federal government. You know, Mayor, the, the public saw Governor Carter, President Carter, uh, as a smiling, easygoing person. Was he? He was to me, and that's all I can go by. He was very pleasant to work for. Do you have a favorite Carter story? I guess the funniest thing that I can recall was when he was thinking of running for the presidency and he announced to his family and his mother and says, I'm going to run for president. And his mother, Miss Lillian Carter, said, President of what? <laughs> so you knew the Carter family very well. Yes. Tell yes. us about the family. Well, when he got into the campaign, um, I did the scheduling for all his family members. And they were very active in helping him uh, win the nomination. It was said at one time that there were 13 Carters uh, in 13 different states during that campaign. That could have been because he had a mother that was campaigning, he had Aunt Sissy Dobbin that was campaigning, he had uh, Sister Ruth Stapleton, he had Jack and Judy Carter, he had Chip Carter, and he had Jeff and Annette Carter, and of course uh, he and Rosalind. Mm -hmm. And they usually campaigned separately. Mm -hmm. They went in different directions. Were you surprised when he won? No. Were you, were you surprised when he lost no. in 1980? No. What do you think happened to President Carter? Well, it was circumstances beyond his control. With the situation, with oil embargoes, the Iranian hostages, and just a combination of many things. So but the main thing was the Iranian hostages. Mm -hmm. So uh, Governor Carter left office in 75. Uh, and was elected uh, president in 76. And you went to Washington? Yes, after the campaign. With the Carter administration. I, I was in the uh, campaign here, 
and our offices was in the national headquarters, which was at Colony Square. And then after he won the nomination, I went to Washington uh, in November of 76 with the inaugural committee. So what did you do with the inaugural committee? Well, one of the things I had to do was to go back and search the appointment book and find the names and addresses of everywhere he spent the night when he was campaigning all over the United States and see that a list was compiled where those people would be invited to uh, the inauguration and events that he was having at the mansion. And then one of the biggest things I had to do was to work with the Georgia people that were constantly, <coughs> excuse me, calling and wanting invitations to the inauguration, and that was a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And I tried my best to comply with all requests. Uh, Mary, uh, Governor Carter and his wife, Rosalind, uh, did a historical thing by walking from the uh, stand where he was sworn in to the, to the White House. Uh, uh, was that a planned event? I have no idea. You don't know? I saw them do that. I saw them walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. All right. I bet the Secret Service had a fit. The president. But staff, I, at that time, he was the most popular he was from that day forward. That was his high moment. Well, the president's staff included uh, many Georgians, including Bert Lance, in whose office you work later. Yes. Tell us about uh, tell us about your duties at the uh, O office of O. BM, is it? No, Office OMB. of Management and Budget. OMB. And we were in the uh, White House complex in the old executive building. And um, I did the same thing for him, scheduling and keeping his calendar and keeping him informed on events he should attend. Well, tell us a little about Mr. Lance. Mr. Lance was a very hardworking person. He would leave the office late in the afternoon and he would be carrying home his work in a big pasteboard box, great big pasteboard box. And he went over everything that evening in his home and then brought the work back the next morning to be acted upon. Mm -hmm. He was very close to the president. Yes. He was his highway director when he was governor. Mm -hmm. In fact, Mr. Lance ran for governor. Yes. And he would have made a good governor. Mm -hmm. Didn't quite make the runoff. Well, he resigned when in 1977. Uh, who replaced him? Uh, James T. McIntyre from Georgia. And I was, you worked with Jim? I stayed right on there until the end of the Carter administration, doing primarily the same type work. Well, let's talk about some other Georgians that were there. Uh, one comes to mind is Hamilton Jordan. Tell me about Hamilton. I think you know about as much about <laughs> Hamilton as I do. Hamilton marched to his own drummer. He was very smart, very intelligent uh, person and a great advisor to uh, President Carter. Uh, how about Jody Powell from Georgia? Jody served as the press secretary for the entire term, so I consider he did a good job or he wouldn't have stayed for four years. <laughs> Press secretaries come and go. They don't last very long, do they? Not usually. Uh, how about Frank Moore from Dahlonega? Frank Moore uh, worked with uh, Congress. He called on the, con the Congress. And another Georgian who was there was Jack Watson. He eventually became uh, executive secretary to the president following Hamilton Jordan. Mm -hmm. uh, did you work any with President Carter after he was defeated and came back to Georgia? No, I did not. He came back in January and I stayed on until uh, March of 81. And of course I was interested in all that he was doing and making plans to build the Carter Center. 
You were involved in the you are involved in the Carter Center. I volunteer there and have for the last 15 years and hope it will be available to me the balance of my life. It's a wonderful place to be involved. How do you how will you remember uh, Jimmy Carter? He was a person that was a, a free thinker and a man kind of ahead of his times. And that has been proven in the last few years when you go back and see some of the things that have come to pass that he advised and discussed when he was president. That people didn't listen to him and they should have, especially on energy. Mm -hmm. So after Carter's uh, defeat, uh, you came back to Georgia came back to Georgia and I came in March and then August uh, went back to work for Lieutenant Governor Zell Miller. Mm -hmm. And you worked for Miller until he completed his uh, his fourth term as Lieutenant 16 Governor. years. 16 years. Tell us about your relationship with Zell Miller. Well he's one of the best friends I've ever had. I love Zell Miller and his family and he's always been thoughtful and considerate to me and my family. Mm -hmm. And I consider him one of my closest friends. So uh, in 1980, Lieutenant Governor Miller decided to run for the Senate seat of Senator Herman Talmadge. Uh, what do you remember about that election? I was in Washington at that time with the Carter administration and I was very surprised the next day to hear the results of the, the Georgia Senate election. And what went through my mind was that Zell Miller has elected another senator. And it wasn't Zell Miller. Hmm. So you think that that campaign did, did not serve S Senator Talmadge very well? It defeated him. Well, you uh, you were with Miller uh, when he uh, ran for governor uh, in nineteen uh, what ninety. 90. 19. He w he took office in ninety one. Yeah, he, he won in he won in nineteen ninety, and you immediately went down into his office. Yes. And you were you were his. Uh, Appointment secretary. And scheduler. Yeah. Well, help us understand what you did as a scheduler. And don't say schedule. <laughs> schedule. Yeah. Well, all the invitations came to me and requests for appointments. Those people who were trying to see the governor. And almost all of them I presented to him. Some of them he didn't always see that he shouldn't have seen. Mm -hmm. And I acted on his decisions. He decided where he wanted to speak and where he wanted to, to go and who he wanted to see, other than just the required duties of a governor, routine meetings that he knew he would be having. And he would set those up and we'd get them on the calendar and he would, he would do that. He had a very young and aggressive staff. He had uh, young people that... After he became governor, but when he was lieutenant governor, he had too many old people on his staff, and I told him that. <laughs> and I tallied the age, and I gave him a percentage. And then I think after that, he kind of looked around for some younger people. Well, he had some good ones that, uh, that served him well. Uh, Hank Huckabee was one. Did you know Hank? Yes, I did. Very competent person. And what were his duties? He was in the Office of uh, Management Budget, of uh, State right. Budget Department, I think they called it. Right. Uh, tell us about Miller. What kind of guy was he? At heart, he is a teacher and a writer. And I think he got into politics to help the lives of other people. And he was a, a thinker ahead of his time. He had, didn't need uh, think tanks 
to come to mind, his mind, what needed to be done. He was his own think tank. And you could rarely ever change his mind. I never did try to change his mind because he was usually always right. Well, he had a very close uh, race for re-election in 1994. Uh, uh, in fact, many thought he might lose, but he won. Uh, what do you remember about that? Well, I think the flag was an issue. And at that time, he had probably uh, quit do, making all his own decisions and listened to other people and brought that about. What did you do after Miller left office in uh, 19, uh, what, 90? Well, I want to say one more thing about uh, Governor Miller in 1992, I think it was, that he, I went to the Democratic National Committee uh, Convention with him as a staff person, and at that time, he made a keynote address for President Clinton, and he was very instrumental in helping President Clinton win that election because they had some of the same advice from some of the same people, and it worked out for uh, Governor Miller, and it also worked out for President Clinton. So what did you do after Miller left office? Well, I we retired a time or two. <laughs> Uh, so you didn't do anything. Were you surprised? Well, I was going to the Carter Center, and I was doing some volunteer work. I just wasn't sitting at home. Were you surprised when he was appointed to the Senate to replace Paul Coverdale? Well, I first was surprised that, that uh, Senator Coverdale had such an untimely, unfortunate death. And uh, yes, I guess I was surprised. I knew he had years, years back wanted to go to the Senate, but a lot of time had passed from the time he aspired for the office as to the time it became available to him. And I think he really had some mixed emotions about it. Was he, as always, was he always as independent as he was as a senator? Yes, but he, he, he changed a lot. How? Well, usually we always saw things politically the same. He changed and I didn't. But that doesn't make any difference in my respect and love for Zell Miller. I remained a very staunch liberal Democrat. Yeah. What did you think when he made the keynote address at the National Republican Convention. I think you can almost know how bad it hurt me that it, that happened. But it was his choice and I respected his decision. How do you think Governor Senator Miller should be remembered? He should be remembered uh, first and foremost by the lottery and w the long of standing effect it would have on this state. And what he did in uh, starting the pre-K and what he did all the way through the Hope Scholarship into higher education and into, into the technology he brought into this state by lottery funds. That's enough. <laughs> if he never had a, another thing to his credit. What were you thinking uh, over those 50 years that you've been involved in politics and government about your career? Well, I've had a wonderful career. I've enjoyed every person that I've ever worked for. And I could almost uh, make a riddle. I've worked for four governors, two, le two lieutenant governors, and one president. One president, how many men is that? <laughs> That's a riddle for you. <laughs> well, I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> uh, well, let me ask you this question. 
Who has been the most influential person in your life? In my life of, the, of these governors? Well, in your life, in your whole life. My mother. Your mother. Mm -hmm. What sort of relationship did you have with your mother? A mother and daughter relationships, up and down. But she was uh, always right when I think back on it. Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't think so. Who has been the most impressive person in your life? Why do you want to ask me that, Bob? Because I'm interested. I know you. I know that your career, you've been a, you've been a very successful person in your life. I wish my life emulated yours. You've been so successful. That's your thinking. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about politics in general. Politics uh, is treated nowadays as a dirty subject. Why do you think that people think so badly about the profession? I think a lot of it has to do with what they hear on television day in and day out, from talking heads and these people that don't think for themselves. They can listen to things that are not always correct but they form opinions. In other words, you think that uh, the media uh, has too much influence over politicians and politics? I do. Why do you think that most present-day Georgians are frustrated with government? Waste in government and the economy and some of the things that have gone on uh, in the legislature that were not productive enough ethics. for the citizens. How about ethics and government? Everybody is against wrongdoing, should be. Well, you can't uh, control a person's ethics. Do you think that the ethics laws in this country and in this state are strong enough? No, I do not. How would you change them? They can't be changed because the people that have to change them are not going to change them. Mm -hmm. I know you might probably don't want to answer this question, but who's been your favorite boss? I didn't have a favorite. You're being evasive. No, I'm not being evasive. Who's the best governor? I didn't see any difference in the accomplishments and the people that were coming and going. You always were dealing with the same people in business and in government. No matter who was governor, you saw the same people as long as the Democrats were under the gold dome. Well, let's talk for just a second about females in government. Uh, do you feel that the gender bias uh, hurts uh, female candidates when they run for public office? Yes, but not as much as it used to. We are improving that little by little. Did you ever consider running for public office? Never. Would you run? No. Mary, what advice uh, do you have for young people who might want to work or serve in government? Well, first, you really have to have the desire. And then I think you have to be educated to study the issues and know exactly which direction you would want to go. Looking back over your many years as a, a staff member for important political people, uh, is there anything you might have done differently I'm sure I could have been a better employee in some ways. But as far as my decisions and the places I worked, I couldn't improve on them. I do regret that I didn't go back to Georgia State and finish my degree when I could walk from the Capitol down there.
Tell us about your family. I was married uh, for 52 years. I married when I was 17. Had two sons um, and two grandsons. Mm -hmm. Had okay. one brother who's now deceased. Mm -hmm. And also my husband is deceased. Tell us about Herschel. He worked some in the Capitol, didn't he? I had no part in that. He worked as a Senate doorkeeper and I certainly didn't use any influence to get him there. I was surprised when he told me he'd been called to come to work. And he was hired by Cap Hicks and he thoroughly enjoyed the, the job and uh, in fact we rode in and out to work every day together. And I think he was well liked and well respected. He was. Well, Mayor, we've covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. Have we left anything out? I think you've asked about everything that you could possibly ask me. Is there anything you'd like to say that I didn't ask you? No. Well, we appreciate you being on our program. It's always good to see you, and I wish you very much luck in the future. Thank you very much.